Why, hello, everybody. This is Eric Virathaler of Virathaler Studios, back for the next episode of Sit Down by the Fire. I'm here with my next special guest. Please introduce yourself. Hey, Erica. Andrew Pearson, actor, producer, and stuntman as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for taking time out of your day to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, certainly, of course. So, so yeah, so my first question, uh, so tell so tell my audience, what exactly started your whole journey with, like, with all this? <laughs> with all this. Um, originally, a long time ago, I did radio, so... I had about 10 years of radio experience under my belt, maybe, maybe 12, counting some of the early days of interning and whatnot. But um, I took a hiatus for a while, as you know what happened to radio, it changed right. dramatically. So I ended up um, doing sales and marketing and, you know, the regular job type thing. And we were watching Terrifier 2, believe it or not. And Carissa and I were like, wait a minute, how is this movie in the theater? And we talked to the manager, and he's like, well, it's only been – you know, it's going to be in for two days. That's it. It's not going to be in any longer. And all of a sudden, it's in there six weeks. And I'm like, wow. You know, if they can make a movie like Terrifier, we can do the same thing. So I was like, you know what? We've got to do this. And it just was an adventure that just took off. Nice. Awesome. Well, uh, that actually is the first time I, I have, I've ever had anybody tell me that it was the Terrifier movies. So I like to actually inspire them. And, and so, hey, I mean, that's a first. <laughs> I mean, I love horror films, but that's oh, yeah. the one that kind of tipped it into like, hey, if they can make Terrifier, you know, we can do that too. So. Oh, yeah. Certainly so. And, you know, and of course, there's an old time saying like that if it can happen to one person, well, then ultimately it can happen to anybody, right? I think so. Hey, if you really want to do it, you just do it. You know, you don't have a plan B. You always have a plan A. Plan B becomes plan A if you don't do it. So I always have a plan A and that's it. We're doing it. Certainly, yeah. And, and I mean, life is just way too short to not go do what you love. I totally agree. Certainly, yeah. And, and yeah, uh, I actually saw Terrifier 2 first when a lot of people would say they saw Terrifier 1 first. And yeah, and then after I saw Terrifier 2, and then it got me curious to go watch Terrifier 1. And uh, yeah, a lot of people will talk about with Terrifier 2, They'll talk about that infamous scene, and I will never forget. My jaw was dropped the entire time. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. At the end of the day, we were in the theater, and I'm like, wow, people are walking out. <laughs> I'm like, this has got to be brutal. I mean, I guess, you know, we like horror, so it's one of those things that when you watch it in a horror movie, it's not surprising. It's surprising in the theater because big studios don't really put together movies like Terrifier. You know, they're afraid of them. Because, you know, they're, I mean, look at one and two. Well, the amount of gore is just crazy. The mashed potato scene is just, no spoilers if you haven't seen Terrifier 2, but the mashed potato scene's over the top. And I liked it, but I saw people walk out. I really did. I'm like, uh oh. Certainly, yeah. And then, you know, and then the Terrifier movies just really go to show that sometimes you do have to take risks because if you don't take risks, you then can have a missed opportunity. Well, it's, you know, what's, uh, we were just talking about this um, for some of the projects I'm working on. What makes you different than everyone else? Yeah. You know, right now Hollywood's being really safe and I get it. I, I totally get it. It was a hard time with all the strikes. It's a hard time with the Me Too movement, but it's been very safe. So indie world for movies is, can do whatever they want. It's the Wild West, you know, it's mm -hmm. like they can take the chances. They can do that. And that's what I love about the Terrifier movies. They take the chance roll the dice and give people something that's not being offered right now in Hollywood. Oh yeah, certainly so. And, and I mean, for Terrifier 3, knowing that it's number one at the box office and it beat Joker 2. And that's, I mean, that's huge, especially it for is. an indie I mean, I know Joker's gotten some slack, but for an indie film, I mean, to beat a two, was it $200 million movie? Yep. That's, that's huge. That's it is. That you should be really proud of. So I, I'm, I'm very happy for the Terrifier crowd. And, you know, they've done a great job. Damien Leone's a great director. And the stars of the movie did a, a great job with the third one as well. So, Oh, yeah, certainly so. And uh, and and one of the things that I, I could praise those films for is the fact that, honestly, I was at a point for the longest time. I was saying, okay, killer clowns have been done so many times in horror movies. And, and I just felt like that, that 
there wasn't anything left to do. But then along came Terrifier, and, and it proved me wrong. Yeah, it's it's something that you know you you wouldn't see it coming, and it's becoming like the next Freddy or Jason. I know people are going to argue with me on that one, but it is. It's an installment that's going to keep going. There's a fourth one on on the table coming, so. Yeah, you know, people want it. You give people what they want. That's that's what entertainment's all about. They ask for it, you give it to them. So. Yeah, and a really good example of that. I mean, changing genres uh, with the first Sonic the Hedgehog movie with that original design. I mean, people made it very clear, including myself, saying, "Oh gosh, this thing's hideous, and I, I don't want to watch it." Like if Sonic is gonna look like roadkill and so <laughs> <laughs> and so and then luckily that paramount actually listened to the fans and that they had that accountability they're like okay we messed up we're we're gonna go back to the drawing board and yeah everybody is in universal a agreement it'll be really hard to find anybody who will like that old design but yeah i i, I mean you got to give them huge props like that like that they actually went back and they changed it I know. And I think I heard most of the movie was done. Yeah. It's not, if not all of it. So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of money to flush away. But I mean, if you know, it's not going to produce at the box office, why would you keep going? So, I mean, Hey, exactly. that's, that's huge. And I mean, you know, it's a smart move from the, uh, the Hollywood side to go, Hey, we should do it differently. We can do it better. Even though we just made it, the fans want this. So deliver what the fans want. It turned out being a, a huge success right after that. Certainly, yeah. And I, I mean, if it wasn't for them changing that design, I mean, I highly doubt that we would have gone the Knuckles show and, and I highly doubt that we would have gone Sonic 2 or, or Sonic 3. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do agree. I, for Paramount to go back and change the design, I, I honestly think saved that whole entire franchise. Yeah. And, I, and you know what? It was an expensive gamble that they did, but it paid off. <laughs> that's, oh, yeah. that's a good thing. It paid off, you know. It's like you can't argue when it pays off. And you do a big gamble and you're like, okay, we're going to listen to the fans. We'll redo it. We'll recut it. It paid off because there's been follow up to Sonic and it's become a franchise, which no one no one ever thought it would be more than one Sonic movie. But hey, you know, it was a smart move by the studio. That it was. And honestly, uh, I'm also surprised like that it, it took them as long as they did to finally make a Sonic movie. And, uh, you know, uh, I just thought that they would have made one in the 90s. And according to my research, they actually tried. Uh, they actually tried to get Michael J. Fox like to be the voice of Sonic back in the 90s. And, and I mean, hey, like at that time, it, it certainly does make sense like to have him be Sonic out of all people back back then. But then, you know, for more reasons than one, uh, that that Sonic movie never happened, and then ultimately it finally happened in 2020. And uh, I mean, hey, I guess there's that saying that it's always better late than never, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm glad it came out. It's a great. It was a great movie, and it started a, a bunch of follow-ups, which you know have been successful as well. Oh yeah, certainly. And one of the things that I loved about the first Sonic movie, I actually was pleasantly surprised with, with that Sonic meme. I actually was really surprised even that made a cameo <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know hey that hollywood sometimes hollywood does things for them but then the public finds out so it, it's it's pretty neat when that happens as well oh yeah certainly so and so yeah and so so yeah and so how was your first experience like uh making a film you know what it was as an actor uh, actually it just happened recently i've been all of a sudden it's been my, my acting career has taken off very quickly, which I'm, I'm very thankful for. Uh -huh. um, Chase Dudley, who just finished Blood on the Bleachers. I, I played um, a dad. In the movie. I can't give away too many spoilers here. Oh, yeah. it was a small, small role, but um, it, it was pivotal in the movie. And I played Lisa Wilcox was actually my wife in the movie, even though we didn't have any scenes together. Um, it, it was just, I walk on the set and you're like, oh my gosh, I know the lines. And I remember Chase coming up to me and goes, holy cow, look how big you are. You look like The Rock. I mean, there, you, you can't see my size right here, but I'm tall. I'm big. I'm bigger than, you know, I'm as big as your big Hollywood um, people like The Rock. I'm literally that big. So he goes, no, we're, and he goes, Andrew, throw the script out. We're not using it. We're, I'm going to have you take this and we're going to do this scene. And I, I was like, hmm. No, no. The, I, trust me, I, I memorized the script. It's good. I got this. I spent forever doing things. Go, no, throw the script out. And I'm like, oh. 
So it was it turned out great though. I said Chase is a good guy. And if it wasn't, we'd redo the scene a hundred times until you got it the way we wanted it. So uh, it was it was scary but fun. And that you know that's a slasher film. The trailer just dropped, and um, distribution should be next year. So I'm excited. Small role, but it was a great first time on a, as an actor on the set. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, and I mean, if, if it makes you feel any better, I mean, ultimately, every actor has to start from somewhere. And, you know, and a, a lot of actors actually do start off small. Like from what I heard, uh, like from what I heard, like that Matt Damon actually started off doing like extra roles. But then he but then he eventually, you know, became what he is now. And, and I mean, hey, I mean, ultimately, you I, I mean, hey, I mean, ultimately, you got to start from somewhere. You do. I mean, the good thing about right now, the, the landscape with movies has changed tremendously. Hollywood's on a, a shift and everything is just all up in the air. Um, the SAG strike affected this. The writer's strike affected it. There's not enough movies right now at the theaters to actually fill all the screens. So that leaves a lot of openings for indie films, indie productions smaller budget, micro budget movies, things like that. So it, it was a great opportunity for me to step in as an actor and go, okay, I can do this without, you know, going on the street corner. Hey, I'll work for food. Hire me, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it was one of those things that I'm like, I, I, I'm going to try this. And I remember it was actually Chase Dudley's first, one of his big movies that he put out, Payday. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's an action movie. And um, the guy that, I can't remember his name, that played the sheriff in the movie. I'm like, man, a big guy like that can be successful in an action movie, I can too. You know, why not? Action, yeah. horror, and I'm like, you know what? And then with the whole world being upside down with, you know, all the strikes and everything, it put a screeching halt with Hollywood. So they're catching up right now. And there's just opened up the indie world's exploded with films. So that's a good thing. Oh yeah, certainly so. And then, you know, like as far as the indie world goes, like I really truly do think that that's one of the things like that gave the Terrifier franchise, like the advantage that I have. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. I walked in the theater. I'm like, man, wow. I was like, I, 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 this is what's funny. You get the AMC movie pass, and you're like, have it. I can watch three movies a week. Okay, what, what's this one, this one? So I, I literally still have it, and they know me at the AMC theater. So it's funny. They know me because I watch everything. I don't just watch horror. I don't watch action. I watch everything, rom-coms. I want to know what's going on. So we walked into a terrifier, and I'm like, and Carissa, who's my wife, and she's also a producer, I'm like, you're going to like this. She's like, I don't know. You know, I like Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, I said, you're going to love Terrifier. So we walked out. I'm like, why can't we do movies like Terrifier? Why? It's opening up Hollywood's change. It's like, why can't we be those people that are in the movies and putting them together? You know, and there's no reason why we can't. So I, I saw the advantage of Terrifier just being successful. They were literally supposed to be there for 48 hours. That's it. It was a limited release with AMC. I was living in Orlando, so we, we were getting every, we got every picture, even if it was for half a day. We would get the movies, and I'm like, okay, it's showing up, we're going to go see it. You know, the indie ones, the international films. So um, I was like, this is phenomenal. We walked out there, I'm like, I love this movie. And I'm like, I can't believe it's not a major studio that put this together. They did great with every aspect of it. You know, everyone has their opinion, but I, I usually will never down someone on their creativity or what they produce. So I think they did decent work with the cinematography, the acting, the the gore, the effects, everything, put it together. You couldn't tell it wasn't made by a major studio, at least in mine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, certainly so. And um, even when I was watching Terrifier 3 in, in, in the theaters, you know, after seeing Terrifier 1 and 2, and I mean, of course, I get it, like, for what they had for the first two movies, they had to work with what they had. But even watching the third one on the big screen, I'm like, wow, I can definitely tell that they got much better quality cameras oh yeah i, I enjoyed I, I saw different angles with this i, I watch movies different than most people i look at the angles like yeah look at that they're cutting in real tight on this um you know i, I think every time and the whole goal is a producer and someone that does movies every time you try to what else can we improve on the next one? what didn't go well you should always be self-checking yourself you know if you're an actor what one what you can't even tell what went well until it comes out. A lot of times the director's not going to share a scene with you, but you you should always be self checking. What went well? What can we improve? What what is great? What what could we do different that would make the next one even better? So I think they did that, and it, it literally showed that it came off that way. So. Oh yeah, oh yeah, certainly so. And, and I mean, especially with like this whole business, like. 
the last thing that you want to do is to make yourself seem like that you have it all figured out, you have all the answers. It's because ultimately we don't have all the answers. Um, and then I just really feel like that if you humble yourself and then if you acknowledge, you know, that you don't have it all figured out, you don't have all the answers. I just feel like that that just allows a lot more like like that allows you like to develop more as a person. And you know what's funny? A lot of people dismiss the crew. No. Don't ever dismiss your crew. If they're good, a lot, I, this is what I learned in horror movies. A lot of the crew, they're just, you know, they're, they're so involved. I remember I, I, we were doing a scene, and I'm like, the scene is not, you know, the director's like, Andrew, what do you want to do? And I remember we had my sound guy, and the cinematographer is like, you know what? You should do this, 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 and this. And I'm like, okay, let's try it. You know, let's do it. I'm like, man, that's a great idea. And the input they had is they're the ones that are, you know, a lot of times, especially in horror, outside of anything else, the horror people are fans, especially in indie horror. Um, they're the ones that know what they want to watch. They're the ones that know what looks good. And they're the ones that know what would take a scene just over the top. So you've got to listen to all the other people because if not, you're not going to grow the movie. It's not going to be successful and it's not going to be engaging as far as I Oh, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where you want to absorb information like a sponge uh, is because the more information that you absorb, the more that you can learn. Absolutely. I agree. Certainly. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And I mean, a lot of people tend to forget that as far as my knowledge goes, most of, of the big name horror franchises, they actually originally started off as independent films like Friday the 13th, a nightmare on Elm street. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, I mean, a, a nightmare on Elm street, if it wasn't for that movie, New Line Cinema never would have never would have became what it eventually what it uh, eventually is. Yeah, I, I it's funny. I don't, are they even around? I don't see. I, I don't. I think they might have merged. But back in the eighties, that was that became New Line became the name or one of the names for horror back in the eighties. Oh yeah, certainly. I mean, I think I might have heard something about how they merged with Warner Brothers. I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, uh, I definitely have to do some research on that. But I mean. A lot of recent movies I've seen haven't had their logo, so I, I mean, I mean because of that, it is definitely very reasonable to infer that they might have partnered up with Warner Brothers or some other big name company. But, but yeah, I mean, as of right now, I can say that I do not know. I mean, look at Bloomhouse; they did the same thing. The Universal and Bloomhouse are like that now. So I mean, and Bloomhouse start out independent and small. They just, you never know; it can happen. I, that's. That's one the great thing about, you know, doing independent movies. You never know. It could happen. It's it's like the right place, the right time, the right audience, the right exposure. I mean, it's just a lot of things. And, you, you know, you try to control all of them, but one thing is just going to set that movie right off. So, I mean, you know, it's it's really cool that a lot of the big horror ones start out with independent films. Yeah, like, matter of fact, I believe when, I believe, well, like, when Blumhouse made Paranormal Activity, that had a really low budget, like like fifteen grand or fifty grand or something like that, and it made millions and millions of dollars at the box office. Uh, I mean, then it became one of like the big name horror franchises, and, and yeah, and I mean, that is huge. Yeah, it's. I remember another movie that came out, and I have not seen it, and I might butcher the name of it. What is it? Skinamaranic about. It was a skin skin about two years ago. It was a Canadian film that showed up at AMC. Believe it or not, AMC is. AMC is one of the best places for independent um, horror. So that showed up, and I, I didn't even, I still haven't seen it. People have told me about it. Um, but it, it was like 12,000 US to make. Wow. And it made millions at the box office. So it stayed there again. It was supposed to be one or two days with AMC, and it stayed there for weeks. And I, I was just like, wow, if they can do it, we can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, exactly. And I mean, ultimately, all these low budget indie horror films. It just goes to show that Hollywood doesn't need to waste millions and millions of dollars on like a really big budget. I mean, you, you can have a movie be a small budget, but you can have it return a big profit. And a lot of people have been saying that that's one of the reasons why Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny and a lot of other big budget franchise movies like that came out in 2023 um, that should have been hits. But they weren't hits it's because of their budgets were just way way too big and then yeah and, and then you know uh long came terrifier and, and some of these other movies that had pretty small budgets 
And, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why that, why that a lot of people that I met, like, will say, yeah, I, I mean, if you want to get into the indie film world, I mean, there definitely is a huge market, like for horror films, like in independent films, because a lot of times you don't need to have a big name star. I mean, can it help? Sure, uh, of course, but you don't have to, though. No, I totally agree. And I've seen movies take off with people who've never heard of. I mean, no one's ever heard of me before, and I'm in a bunch of movies. So, you know, it's it's one of those things. I mean, eventually, will they? Maybe. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's literally how they, they don't look at the, at least not outside of the major films, they don't look at the actor and go, wow, Andrew's in that movie. I mean, they might eventually, but they want it, they go for, you know, the entertainment value. And as long as we're delivering the entertainment value, that's what matters. As long as people are embracing that movie, that's the most important thing. Oh, yeah, certainly so. And that's one of the things why that I love to entertain people. Um, it's because I just love to bring that joy into people's lives. I like that, knowing that I can bring that uh, escapism into their lives, like for whatever stress or strife or whichever life circumstances that they're dealing with. I mean, knowing that I can make them happy, that makes me happy. That is, that's very important. That's it's an escape. Movies are an escape, you know. And the people that are passionate about it, I've found, are the ones that used it as an escape throughout their life. And the ones that are in it, that are involved in it right now, either cast, crew, they're the ones that had it as an escape. So that's you know, I'm one of those people. So I have no problem saying that. Yeah, and, and, right. And I, I mean, heck, and I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people who are in the film business probably will honestly will say the exact same thing. Yeah, and I mean, that's good. You want people like that. You want the fans involved because that's how you produce a great movie. Certainly, yeah. And, and I mean, ultimately, you definitely should do it. It's because you genuinely love it. Totally agree. Yeah, I, I, yeah, because um, if you don't love it, well, then what's the thing? Well, then what's the point, right? You can always tell when people enjoy what they're doing and when they don't. You know, you, if you walk around a set and a lot of people that are watching, you know, unless you're in the business, you walk around the set, you know, who really likes being there, who's, you know, not just going for a paycheck. It's, you're not going to retire a millionaire off being in movies. I mean, there's five, what, what I read, 5% of actors make enough money to survive full time. You know, that's a very, that's, that's, that's playing the lottery and winning, you know, so you better do it because you love it. And you better have that passion for it because you can do anything else and make a lot more money doing anything but movies. So have that passion, bring it, and deliver it for the audience. Oh, yeah, certainly. So it's because of when you have that passion, it definitely will show it. On, it definitely will show it like on the TV or the big screen. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and, and so out of all the movies you you have done, either acting or behind the scenes wise, what would you say was the most fun that you ever had? <laughs> I, you know what? I just got done filming um, a huge scene for Devour about a week ago in Georgia. And I worked with Gavin Wilde from Righteous Gemstones. If you've ever seen that show, he plays the young, like John Goodman's younger version of his son in the series. And Gavin and I had a blast. Um, we just it was it was nine hours of shooting one scene i mean that's where passion comes because it's not rush 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 scenes done um we literally spend we had stunts we had action you know it's a horror film there's blood there's everything else and it was just a great time and i remember we i mean i posted facebook you know we're doing selfies having a fun time on the set and that's when you're like oh my gosh it started out at like six o'clock at night and we're like, it's 4 a.m. <laughs> like, uh -huh, yeah. Where did the time go? You know, and we're having, and then what it's really fun is when you forget the cameras there. As an actor, you don't even know where the camera is because you're not paying attention. It's like you and me, we're, we're focused on each other and you forget the cameras there. And they're like, I, I, and I feel embarrassed. The only time I've ever done this, they didn't tell me when they're blocking the scene. I'm standing there, you know, I'm, a, I'm playing a cop in the, in the movie and I'm like, I had my gun out and everything else and I back up I literally tripped over the camera guy. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm like, please do not have this on a scene we're going to watch beyond the scenes. But I literally, I was like, back it up, back it up, boom. And I tripped. I didn't even know he was there. I, I had no idea the camera guy was right behind me. The cinematographer was right behind me. And I literally, I was so embarrassed. I'm like, and I had to catch myself on the car and I'm like, 
but we had a blast. I mean, that was one movie. Stan Hansen's a great director. It looks like a five million dollar budget film, and that's why I was like, I want to do this movie. So that's why I signed up for. It. I mean, he does stuff over the top. We have stunt coordinators, and it's an indie film, but it's great. There, there should be a limited theatrical release next year. Awesome. Well, uh, awesome. Well, awesome. Well, I certainly will be sure to check that. I, I definitely will be sure to check that film out. And, and as far as you tripping over the camera guy, I really <laughs> hope that you didn't accidentally break the camera because that would have been expensive. Yeah, I was like, let's see, you know, new car or the camera. And, and it's, it's sad because I did that one other time. I was filming um, in August, Clan Motel 3. I played Specialist Duke in that movie. I'm one of the leads of the movie. And we were in the graveyard. And we had been doing the scene all morning. It was like two hours in, and the sun, it's hot, it's 110 degrees outside. I'm out there doing the scene. I'm supposed to back up like this and go, no, no, it's all good. Turn around and run. Well, we had been doing the scene in the same position, you know, the start of the scene in the same spot. They moved it about an hour and a half, and we moved it backwards. And I was used to, and mentally, you know where all the gravestones are. You know where you're exiting because you've been doing the scene over and over and over. Well, we changed it. And the graveyard didn't line up. And I'm glad I was off frame. I nosedived over a stone or over one of these wooden grave markers into the ground. And I look up, the whole crew's like, <laughs> like oh, God. Guys, I'm good, don't help me, I'm good. But yeah, that's the second time I ever tripped somewhere on, on, on set in a scene. Yeah, geez. Well, it, it sounds like they, you have an unfortunate history of like of tripping. Let's hope it's not an expensive one, right? Yeah, certainly. Well, I mean, if it makes you feel any better, uh, I had a similar experience this year when when I actually was filming a, a when I actually was filming like a country music video, and I had a fist fight scene, and we had to do it a few times. I mean, some of the times I didn't trip, but one time I actually did trip. And so, you know, if it makes you feel any better, you know, you're not the only one. <laughs> yeah, it's, I was like, okay. And my wife was on the side for Clown Motel. She's still, she's like, look, I got you tripping in there. And I talked to her and I'm like, no, Andrew, it's, it's out of frame. You know, it's like, you're out of frame. We weren't focusing on you in that shot. So it's out of frame. She's like, oh, I'm going to send it to the director. Watch it. So it'll be on like the DVD. And I'm like, thanks. Or Blu -ray. I'm like, yeah, let's not do that. I don't think it's yeah. like, watching the big guy trip over or something. Yeah, please not, because that would be embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, I was like, we don't need that on behind the scenes. That's good. Yeah, definitely not. You know, uh, it, it's just really unnecessary. So, yeah, actually, matter of fact, it's interesting you mentioned Clown Hotel, because a while ago, I went on Tubi. I was just looking for horror movies on there. And, yeah, and Tubi has an excellent uh, resource of horror movies on there. I mean, honestly, I, I, I think that has the greatest selection of horror movies I've ever seen. And yeah, and yeah, I actually do remember seeing Clown Hotel on there. And I was like, hey, it sounds like an interesting title. And yeah, and then I, and I mean, unfortunately, I didn't have time to finish the whole movie, you know, because life. But yeah, um, it's actually rather a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, that, it was fun. That one was, it was a long two and a half weeks and we had multiple locations when I was filming it. So it was like, by the time you're done, when it's a wrap on the whole, and you're at the beginning of the production at the end, it's like, you, and I, I remember we, we started in Los Angeles. We filmed in um, Hollywood at a bar. We started out there, moved up to Clown Motel in Tonopah. Then we moved down to Vegas outside. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, it was like, boom, 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 boom. And then by the time you're done and the days are long and it's like, wow, by the time it's a wrap, it's like, you need a couple of days. I remember I slept almost 12 hours the next day that we were done wrapping. Uh, that's how tired I was from Clown Motel. Yeah. Well, heck, I mean, at, at that point, knowing how much work you did, knowing how much you traveled, and I, I yeah, and, and I mean, all that hard work pays off. And, and I mean, hey, I mean, ultimately, and I mean, hey, I mean, ultimately, we do need our rest. Yeah, it's, it's and you can and it's it's funny. A lot of people think, oh, being an actor is easy. You sit around, you got you got to you know you you say a couple lines. I remember Blood on the Bleachers in July. I was like, that was another time I was exhausted. I, I mean, when you're doing a dramatic role and it's like it takes everything out of you. You're putting everything in, and if you're doing it good and you're really putting passion in it, you're putting everything behind it. You're putting everything you can in that character to make the character real. So I was so tired. I remember I got up. I was like, I, I went back to the hotel, um, crashed. 
I was like, I slept for 10, 11, 12 hours. I'm like, I never do this. And I woke up and I'm like, well, oh my gosh, I got to check out the hotel. I'm like, this is how tired. I mean, and those, and especially if you had some stunts in it, oh my gosh, when you're doing stunts, lines, I mean, it's, and you're trying to be on because everyone watches the scene. It's two minutes, like the one for Devour. It's probably a two minute scene with a lot of action and whatnot. It took nine hours to make. And that nine was, hours. Yeah, it was, a, and they want, for, you know, Scott Hansen was perfection with it. And I don't blame him. If I was the director, I'd want perfection too. But I mean, those scenes, you're doing it over and over and over. You have to keep the energy level up the whole time when you're doing a scene. You know, you can't go start out really high and then the energy goes down. That's why everyone's offering you coffee on set. Who wants coffee? Who wants coffee? So yeah, it's, it does make you tired if you're, if you're really taking your character and giving it its all. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I, I, I mean, yeah, it's it's a lot of work, and a lot of people underestimate how much work goes into it. I mean, heck, like there are a few shots in a movie that are only like a few seconds or a few minutes long, but even those shots, I like, can take hours. Oh yeah, and it's like they they they, and then they might come up with something else. You might have the whole thing scripted out. They're like, wait a minute, no, let's start this again. I'm like, oh my gosh, we just did the whole scene for two hours. No, this is what we got to do. And then everyone's coming together and you're reworking the scene right there. So that could add even more time. And it's, again, it's, you know, maybe it's a two minute scene on when you actually watch the movie, but you know, it's the producers, the directors, the crew, those people along with the actors that, you know, have to keep up the energy and bring that to life. So it can be tiring. It really can. It can be tiring, but it's well worth it at the end. Certainly, yeah. And, and, and I mean, that's one of the things that happened to me when I filmed that fight scene. I, I mean, yeah, it was a lot of fun, you know, having a fight scene because not that many people can say that they had a fight scene. But yeah, I mean, after a while, having to do it over and over again, it got exhausting. <laughs> and then trying to make sure it was like, did it have the same energy as last take? And it's like, you never know. And then the director never shares it with you. Every actor would be like, can you show it to me again in here? I want to watch the video. No, the, the, yeah, the no. You don't do that. It's like you take, you take, and you hope that what you did was good enough. And you know, unless they're going to show you the dailies at the end of the day of filming, which most people are not going to do that to an actor. You know, it's like you have to take the director's word on. Certainly, yeah, and uh, certainly, yeah, and uh, yeah, and that could be one of the things that that can make a lot more anxious like like for the actor it's like it's like oh it's like oh man i'm not getting any feedback on it and for some actors it could definitely cause them to i can imagine for some actors probably not for every actor i, I can imagine that like that definitely can get them to overthink it oh i've had i've had and actually devour was one we're sitting there gavin and i we they, they're like, cut, and then we're sitting there, we're, on, we're by the cop car. One of the producers runs up, hey, Gavin, look at this. Oh, my gosh, look at this. this is, we took the shot from the video. Look, this looks fantastic. And, you know, then you know things are going in the right direction when either the director is coming up to you, man, this is the best, or a producer or someone else you know that's giving you some positive feedback. You won't get it all the time, but when something's over the top, like on Blood the Bleachers, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, we're in between takes and sit down at this table on the set. And Chase comes up, boom, right with the headphones on. You gotta hear this. I'm like, oh, that's me. Oh, is it good? Yeah, this is great. And you know that's you know, you may not think it's good, but it's the director's vision for that movie. And if it fits in with what your character is supposed to be, then it's good. Oh and yeah. I always have to remind people of that you know, it's the director's vision. It's the you know the other people that are involved in it. And if they think you brought the character to life the right way, then it's good. Oh yeah, and, and I mean, there, there's also even a few cases like when they filmed Titanic, uh, Leonardo a actually messed up on one of his lines, and then, um, um, and then, uh, ironically enough, James James Cameron actually decided to keep that take in the final film. That happens, to, you know. It's like things just. Got, you, uh, I remember one time, you know, it's like I, I sat there. It was like you do a scene thirty times, and it's like, wait a minute, did we just mess up the words? Like, no, that was great, and it just comes out of nowhere because you're used to doing it over and over and over. And one time, I remember, it's just that's when the best things come. They're unexpected. They show up. They go in your head. And they come out, and it's like, and the director's like, no, that's great. And you're like, is it going to be used? You don't know until it actually goes in the film. But those scenes and those takes are the ones that are like, wow. You know, it's it's just there's energy and magic. 
Oh yeah. And, and, and I mean, a lot of times like that, all those spontaneous moments definitely can create some of the most memorable scenes. Like a really good example is when they did Star Wars episode five. I originally Han Solo was supposed to say to Princess Leia, I, I love you too. But instead Harrison Ford improvised his line. He went off script and he said, I know. And then ever since then, <laughs> like that, you know, like it's something that Han Solo would say and then afterwards, there's all these T-shirts and memes made out of it, and yeah. I mean, Terminator, that's another one. I think Arnold Schwarzenegger was supposed to say, I'll be right back. And he goes, I'll be back. And it's like, okay. And that all of a sudden became what – and it wasn't written in the script that way, but that became his signature for all Terminator. Certainly, yeah. And, and I mean, that line became so iconic that he even said that in – I believe the Expendables one or two. It, it, it was at least one of them, yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Oh yeah, it definitely wouldn't surprise me either. Yeah, and I, but yeah, and I mean, as far as Arnold goes, I actually feel kind of sorry for him because you know, I get why that he stepped away from movies because you know he he was governor and he just didn't have time, but then he came back to movies and unfortunately the Last Stand, which I which I personally did enjoy. It's just on the economic level, it didn't do very well at the box office. And then afterwards, he brought in the big guns with the Terminator. And and yeah, Terminator Genesis and Dark Fate, those didn't do well at the box office either. And I'm like, that is really, really unfortunate. Yeah, I, I again, you know, it's five, ten years with anything. You've got a different generation watching it. You've got, you know, it's just people that grew up with Arnold may not be the same people that are going to watch his current movies and they're making them for the new generation or younger generation. And they're not, they know who Arnold is, but they don't know him enough that would maybe necessarily want to spend money and go watch the movie. And maybe they just want to see it on a Netflix or an Amazon or something like that. That's, and it's tough. I mean, you know, he came back and he looked different. I mean, that's, we all get older and we all age. And, you know, I think he's doing phenomenal for where he's at. What is he almost 80 right now? I think. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. He's, you know, you can't argue with that. I mean, you know, I'm I'm huge like him, and it's like, you know, it, it's tough to keep that mass on, and then you know, to age with it's even harder. No one understands that unless you're a guy that's huge, like a Kane Hoder or something like that. You know, but I I still like his work, and you know, I like the last two Terminator movies. You know, I know they weren't the best in the box office, but you know, I still like the franchise. Oh yeah. Certainly so. And, and, and I mean, a, a lot of people like will say that Terminator 2 is not only one of the best sequels ever made, but it's one of the best action movies ever made. And it's one of the best movies ever made. And I mean, yeah, I've seen Terminator 2 and, and I can definitely see why the people would say that. And, and so I can only imagine the like for the filmmakers to make follow ups to that probably must not have been that very easy. No, it's, I mean, it's like, how do you top one of the best movies ever? It's, and then people judge it against it. So, I mean, it, it's tough. And, you know, I got to hand it to them. They did their best with the whole Terminator um, franchise. And, you know, I love Linda, Linda Hamilton. I had a chance to meet her in July. Very oh, nice. Wow. Woman. She is fantastic. And, um, you know, she's very humbled and down to earth. And, uh, you know, it's funny because, she plays totally different inside the, the Terminator franchise, but um, you know, it's people like Linda that make it as well, Arnold, Linda, and to have them in recurring roles throughout the franchise, I I still think there's something to it. I, they want to keep those people in the franchise to keep generations that have grown up with Terminator, but also trying to grab new generations with it. So I, it's a hard balance, it really is. People don't realize that with Hollywood, they're they're looking at their marketing, their demographics, and the movies. And they're trying to keep the, the class of people that keep everyone that's watched Terminator, and then they're trying to get new audiences as well. So it's a it's a hard it's a it's a balance. It's definitely a balance. Oh, it is, yeah. And I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, you you just can't please everybody. And a really good example is the Terminator franchise because people were there there were people who were saying, oh, Terminator Three, it feels too much like Terminator Two, and so and then with Terminator Salvation, they tried something different where it's more of like a war movie and then you know uh and then people still complained anyway and so you know you just really just can't please everybody yeah it's a, it's a shame i mean you know people like that i i always invite come on in the entertainment business we'd love to have you i mean it's like 
You know, they're the ones that can get, you know, the, the true fans, it's great to have true fans. They'll give you the honest feedback. Um, and those people, I always, we run into them. I, I was laughing with Carissa, my partner in life. You know, I said, you know, and horror. I, I, it's, horror is different than everything else. But you have the fans. The true, a lot of true fans are working in horror. And it's great because they can bring the perspective in. I mean, I like horror. I do. I'm not one of the, I'm, you're not going to catch me dressing up necessarily at conventions and things like that. But I, I love horror. But on the level that the horror fans are, and they're actually within the community, I wish we had that for action. I wish we had that for other genres in Hollywood. I think that would help, you know, as far as development of sequels and other movies go. Right. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And, and I mean, a, a lot of people actually got their start in the business because of horror, like Jennifer Aniston, like one of her first movies actually was the original Leprechaun and Jamie Lee Curtis with Halloween. Uh, see, there's there has to be more examples. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's just I just can't remember. Yeah. Matter of fact, I believe even Tom Hanks, like one of his first movies actually was a horror film. That I did not know, so that's good. I'm gonna have to look that up when we're done. Awesome. Well, you know, there's always that saying that you learn something new every day. <laughs> you always do. That's what's good about life. Certainly, yeah. And, and and so yeah, so I can imagine that that must have been really cool. I'd like to meet Sarah Connor herself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She she's very nice. Linda Hamilton, a sweet woman. Um, you know, very humble, down to earth, and the, you know, those are the type of people you really want to interact. I mean, and that are really good with their fans. And, you know, that's, I, I like meeting people that are like that, that really appreciate their fans, really appreciate, you know, the projects they've done. Um, you know, that's that makes a whole difference to everybody. Oh, yeah, certainly so. And I'm assuming that you probably met her at a con. I did. I, was, I think it was Megacon um, back in July. I've had a chance to go to a couple of them, and I'm like, one day, you know, maybe we'll get to do one of these, a Megacon or a Horrorcon or something like that. So um, I love going to them because you just get a, it's a pulse of what's going on. You know, I get to see what people are doing, projects, what's hot right now, where what, what people are gravitating to. You know, I love going to them. And it's just fun. And then to relive a lot of the movies that they have there and all the vendors that are selling everything from props to signatures to you know, fan base things. I mean, it's just, it's a huge overload experience that I love doing. So. Oh yeah. And you know, and one of the things that I love about cons, you know, and probably a lot of people will say the same thing. It's like that you're in an environment of, you're in an environment of like-minded people. Absolutely. And it's like, people are excited about it. You don't, you don't, have, you don't have to explain to someone what something at the con is, you know, it's, I'm sure you've been there. It's like, no, this is really popular. Okay. I don't know what you're talking about, but yeah, I mean, it's like everyone knows it's like you can, you can have conversations with pretty much anyone at a con and they know what's going on with something there, which is really cool. Yeah. And right. And I mean, it's an environment where you feel welcomed. It's an environment where I like that makes you feel fulfilled with life and you know it brings you joy um and then knowing that you and that can meet some of these people like who you looked up to and yeah um it's a uh, but yeah it's definitely a lot of fun i totally agree so yeah so uh so yeah so so what was your first con um oh my gosh a few years ago in orlando um comic was that wasn't comic con it's, I can't remember, Mega, was it Megacon? No. Maybe. It might, it might have been Megacon in Orlando years ago. Um, we ended up going, and I'm like, what is going on? As everyone's talking about it. I'm like, we got to go. And it took up, I remember, they had, you couldn't even get, you had to park 25 minutes away to walk in. I was like, where are we parking? We're nowhere near the convention center. The whole convention center was totally full. The parking was full. They were parking down the road and still charging $30 to park. I'm like, I don't care. We're doing this. So we ended up walking in the heat in Florida in May, going all the way to the con. And it was like, wow. And I was like, this is crazy, especially in Orlando. So you've got Disney and all the major theme parks there. And then to have you know conventions there and cons and everything, it's just Wow. I mean, that's, it's a lot different than North Carolina where I'm at. It's still busy, but Orlando just like, wow. It's like just as impressive as the theme parks. Yeah. And I mean, even though I, I haven't been to Orlando, but uh, 
I have been to Disneyland down in California. And the one thing I will never forget being there is that, you know, people would be texting me and wanting me to text them back. But I'm like, sorry, there's just this gigantic crowd and I got to pay attention. <laughs> where the going. Sorry. Yeah, that's, uh, that's welcome to Disney. Yeah. And I can imagine that like that Orlando is the exact same way It's one of those places where you really need to pay attention as to where that you're going because there's so many people and the, the last thing that you want to do is, is to accidentally bump into somebody oh we lived there eight years and we, we literally just moved last year um to north carolina for a while just to hide out here but um you know orlando we have people driving there's a big billboard of mickey no watch the road trust me I don't want to die today. Watch the road. Yeah. I'll buy the yeah. movie. I don't want to die from this. And they're like, there's billboard, there's stimulation all over the place. It's a great place to live. But I mean, it's just, wow. It's like the traffic's bad. There's a billion theme parks. There's a, there's traffic everywhere. You would think it's New York City. That's how busy it is. But at the end of the day, if you want to watch fireworks, 365 days a year, Orlando. You want to go and go be immersed in movies, you've got Orlando. So that's what the things I loved about it. My my Sunday afternoon was always Universal Studios for about three to four hours and just doing all different things. And then I'd go home. That was that was fine for me. Sunday for three or four hours all year, even in the summer when it's 100 degrees. So. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Well, hey, and I, 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 I mean, you know, it is something like that will keep the kids occupied. Right. <laughs> I, and I think, you know, sometimes the kids get bored in Orlando, believe it or not, because you've seen it too much. But. For me, I never get bored. I can watch Jason Bourne Stunt Spectacular a hundred times. I can go watch, you know, on Velocicoaster over islands, you know, Disney on Ride Tron as many times as I could get in. You know, that's only once or twice, but you know, it's like there's so many fun things to do, and it's just, you know, for me, I'm like a big kid. So, yeah, I um, mean, honestly, I, I actually am really surprised to hear that so many would get bored in Orlando, considering that there's so many things to do there. Yeah, I never do. But again, you know, I'm I'm totally different on you see me in a movie. I'm nothing like, yeah, the idea at one of my movies is like, Andrew, listen, you're totally different on screen and off screen. Like, I like that fun joke. And a lot of times I'll do that on purpose, joke around and have fun because people see me when I'm doing a scene. and I look scary. I'm a big guy. I get mad. I look scary. That's what they want me to do. They want me that alpha male role. That's all they want from me is the alpha male. He's swearing and beating people up and everything. So I always try to have fun. I always talk about, you know, I love roller coasters. I love going to theme parks. So I always talk about the fun stuff. So you never have anything that's short of fun with me. Yeah. Well, hey, and, and, and I mean, you, you know, as far as playing the alpha male, wow, you know, and the joking and funny, I mean, that's one of the fun things I like about acting is that knowing that you are playing somebody who you are not. Yeah. <laughs> and I look the part and they're like, I remember directors are come up and we want it scary. Okay, get on the ground now. It's like, oh my God, you know, it's like, it's not even me. And it's like, someone's like, wow, that's not, that's not you at all. We want, Andrew, we want Terminator. We want you to get on the ground now. It's like, you know, as I play a lot of police, military, things like that. And they, they love that. And I'm beating people up in the movie or killing people or getting killed. So they love that. You know, that's the, I think the whole alpha male thing has come back. And I'm lucky enough to be, <laughs> I'm one of the few people that are 6'3" you know, huge with big chest and arms and all the other stuff that fits that, that, that role. And I'm not an A-list actor. So I, I fit indie world great. So that's, I mean, it's weird, but it's funny because I remember one of the bleachers, they're like, I did the scene and I turn around and they're like, <laughs> and they're like, thankfully we saw you when you're a nice guy because it's scary. I mean, you know, that's, I play the scary part, you know, it's like, I play that guy. It's like, and I swear a lie. I don't use a lot of profanity in general. In every movie I do, they want me to swear and beat people up and everything else. So it's it's very different. I'm I like that fun. I'm a nice guy, and you know I'm you know I support animals. And all I have all kinds of charities that I like to be involved with. So it's a lot different than me beating up people and killing people on movies and acting very authoritative and swearing all the time. But you know that's that's what they happen to like nowadays. It's, you know that type of role. Yeah, and I mean, that's a very common thing like that I hear from actors is that a lot of times that they are the antithesis like of the role that they play. Like even when I had like when I had Sarah Karloff, who's the daughter of Boris Karloff, that's something like that she would always say all the time is that he was the complete opposite like of all those evil roles that he played. Like, yeah, like usually he would play 
the villain, which I can definitely see why that he would. I mean, considering that he was considering that he was very, very good at it. But yeah, but I mean, in real life, Boris actually was one of the nicest people that you could ever meet. Oh, I don't doubt it. And, it, you know, I never wanted to play a villain. I never did. Um, I always wanted to be a hero. Oh, the hero is glamorous. You know, it's like you go in and save the day. But um, Carissa, uh, my wife, a couple of months ago, she's like, you know, I said, you know, I'm disappointed. I've got to kill people in a movie and I've got to do this and this and I'd rather be the hero. She's like, are you crazy? Didn't you see Donald Sutherland before he died? It's like the first thing he goes is, you know, so in an interview with Donald Sutherland, it's like, you know, you always play the bad guy. He's like, you know, people remember the villain. They remember you. Even if you have a small part, they remember you. He played in Hunger Games. He played in Die Hard, you know, as the villain. And people remember the villain. So my whole mind went, Whoop, okay, maybe I do want to play the villain. Maybe I want to play the bad guy. Um, so as an actor, you're like, okay, that may not be the worst thing in the world. And, you know, if that's what people see me as, great. As long as you don't see me that outside of my movies, we're good. Yeah, you know, uh, which reminds me of a another quote from Boris Karloff like that Sarah Karloff mentioned uh, like when I had her on, like, yeah, uh, Boris once said that a typecast actor is a very, a typecast actor is a very lucky actor. Um, it's because ultimately, you know, even if they're typecast, at least that they got their name out there. I, I agree. You know, I agree. Um, it's tough because, you know, I've had d discussions with directors and you're like, okay, well, there I can't. We want you to be part of our project. Okay, great, great. And you're thinking, you know, our initial discussions were for this role, and then all of a sudden, you know, what we want you to do. You know, what you'd be great in a cop. And I'm like, no kidding. <laughs> or <laughs> military, no kidding. Like, I'm filming um, this weekend in, uh, in Los Angeles. I'm playing Commander Gigatron in Alien Horde, and I'm also filming. Um, big pivotal scene for Jacker 3, <laughs> like the next day, two different roles. But, um, you know, it's like they, they see you and they get excited. They're like, no, no, you're the military guy. You're the, you're the, you know, we're going to go, we want you authoritative. We want you bad guy. And then we're a bad cop. You know, I'm talking to someone about playing a bad cop. They were like, they reached out and they go, I said, well, do you want, here, read some stuff from the department or something like that. That's um, a crooked cop. And I'm like, okay, I, you know, I can do that. You know, it's fine. I, I, I can play that role. But I've been fortunate that, you know, not only have I had, you know, opportunities with police and military and whatnot, um, I'm playing in Birthday Bash next year. I'm playing a frat guy that organizes a reunion for his birthday, for a friend's birthday 20 years later. And I play the obnoxious frat guy that's older and aged. So <laughs> that's kind of cool. It's different than military or police. And, right. you know, I've got a couple other. I'm, I am playing Sheriff Porter, though, and Halloween Shark coming up next year. And that one just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And then Will Colazzo, the, the director, is like, Andrew, guess what? We're adding more scenes for you. And I'm like, okay. Awesome. <laughs> this is, you know, and, and at first some people are like, man, more scenes. But I'm like, yeah, I'll just say, hey, do you believe in me that much to let me have more scenes? You know, that's fantastic. I, I'm grateful for every opportunity I get. Yeah, and I mean, ultimately, like with any opportunity that, that you get, even if it's outside of your own interests, like or taste, I mean, I mean, hey, I mean, take any opportunity that you can get because you don't know what kind of doors that, excuse me, but yeah, you have no idea as to what doors that they can open up. I actually, <laughs> I filmed a remote scene for um, this movie, this international horror comedy called Room Number Four, it's a short in Bulgaria. And I play, it's, we're filming at Carissa, my wife's sitting there watching, she almost started laughing. I go, yeah, this is Sarge. You know, do you want to be a real man? Yeah, and it was like, it was kind of like a WWE wrestler from ABA. She's like, I'm like, you can't do this. I'm trying to do this scene and she's laughing. She's like, oh my, she's losing it. I'm like, you need to have, you know, look at this. You can have a 25-year supply of raviolis right here. I would have 50 if I could. You know, that's all you need to have. And it was just it was a parody for VHS, and it was uh, a horror comedy. But I mean, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've never done this before. And putting yourself out there as an actor, <laughs> especially when I hear horror, that's a comedy. You know, it's just that's the big thing. Can you put yourself out there? 
you know, how comfortable are you going to be? Because people are going to critique you all day long. They're going to love you, hate you, be, be on your side, not on your side. They're just You're putting yourself out there as an actor. So I don't mind trying new things. And if it, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Like Walt Disney once said, you know, we're making movies. We've got, if this one isn't a hit, we've got another one coming. You know, that one will be a hit. We just keep going forward and moving forward. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, it's one of those things like where you really only fail only when you stop trying. I, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Certainly, yeah. And so, uh, so yeah. So it sounds like that you got quite a. So it sounds like you got quite a bit of projects coming up soon. And yeah, and you mentioned that uh, some of them like were filmed in Los Angeles, which I, I for the longest time. You had to live in Los Angeles, like to pursue a career in filmmaking. But one of the things that I've noticed, at least, especially like with COVID and, and everything else that's happened, it seems to me, you may or may not agree that while while it certainly can be helpful to live in Los Angeles, but it seems like nowadays you don't have to. And, and so, yeah, like, yeah, like I, I saw that Georgia really is expanding on that, Texas and or Orlando, as you said. And, and so, yeah. And so. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I totally agree. Um, Devour was filmed in Atlanta, and it's still they're finishing up. It's pretty much in the can. Um, you know, Birthday Bash will be in Texas. Halloween Shark next year, Texas. Um, I'm doing one with the Mahals in the in the spring, a horror that's actually being written right now. I'm going to be one of the leads in the movie. Nice. And thank you. And I'm going to be one of their leads, but um, that one will be in Vegas. But the only downside for me, <laughs> you got North Carolina over here, you got Los Angeles over here, and that's a five and a half hour flight. That's like a full day of travel. So that's the only downside. But I do like I have to go to Hollywood twice this month. I have to go. This weekend, then I have to go at the end for Halloween to film another movie. So, um, you know, I have two this weekend I'm doing, and none of them are lead roles. Or like, I'm playing Commander Gigatron in Alien Horde. That's a supporting role. And then I'm doing a pivotal scene in Jacker 3. I can't even really talk about it, but I'm in Jacker 3. That's how pivotal the scene is for the movie. I don't want to, you know, give away spoilers for the movie, but um, you'll see me in Jacker 3 probably the beginning of next year in the Jacker franchise. But yeah, Hollywood, uh, it's great. Love doing it. Um, the set for Alien Horde, I can tell you, um, it's phenomenal. They, uh, it, it's a space shuttle type set, and I'm the flight instructor, so I'm inside, you know, this fantastic, it looks like a multi million dollar set that we're filming on. And it's just, it's, you wouldn't even know. It's like something you would see out of like a $200 million movie. So I'm very thankful and blessed all the time when I when I have those opportunities as an actor to be on sets like that because they just they remind you of you know why you're doing this. It's it's it makes you feel good that you know, they believe in you enough to deliver a product on a really expensive set and be part of a great movie. So. Oh yeah, certainly so, and, and yeah, and you know, um, and it's definitely nice to know that. Uh, but yeah, and, and and it's definitely nice for some people. I mean, considering that Los Angeles, it's definitely very notorious for being very expensive to live at. Like, I have a friend of mine, like who lives in LA, and he told me that he has to pay nearly four thousand dollars per month just for his apartment for him and his family. I'm like, holy crap! That's crazy. It that is. is insane. Yeah. If you if you spent that in my town, you'd be living in a mansion. You would oh, literally have literally have a three or 4,000 square foot mansion here in North Carolina for that. Literally like with gates and everything, <laughs> not a one bedroom in LA squeezed in with three other people. Yeah, definitely. And also on top of that, knowing that they also have pets. And so, yeah, I, I'm like, dang, like, I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do just to survive. And I mean, Hey, I, I mean, at least they have a roof over their head, but, but yeah, yeah. I mean, nearly $4,000 per month. Yikes. That's why we. That's why we're not in LA. <laughs> that's I that's can see why. I mean, right now, at least, unless I make it big as a as an actor for working for one of the big studios, you never know it could happen. But um, I don't even know if I'd want to live in. I love LA. I love traveling there. But I mean, I have Siberian Huskies. They like the outside. Like you know, after this interview, I'm going to take them to the, the 
park. We have this huge reservoir that's three miles around this lake. It looks like Friday the 13th, it really does. But I mean, it's very peaceful and my dogs love, it. you know, we're in the outdoors out here. You know, the most, the most action that happens in my town is on my block. We see the three deer that are crossing the street all the time, the mom and the baby. So, you know, that's about as much action as we get in North Carolina. Nice. Awesome. Uh, um, so it definitely sounds like that you're a big dog person, which is perfect because as you can tell by my logo, <laughs> I, I'm totally not a dog person. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> no, yeah, dogs I, are my least favorite animal. <laughs> I actually did. Um, we owned a, We used to live in Colorado in Denver, uh, Carissa and I, and we owned a doggy daycare and we actually did rescue with Siberia. They're, I mean, they're a pretty breed, but um, they get put the, unfortunately they get euthanized first out of almost all the breeds because when you put them in a cage or they're going to do, they're flipping out, um, which is sad. So I try to do rescue work, but when I was out there, we did rescue work in the movie eight below. Um, a lot of the dogs were from Colorado from the rescue I worked at and we had help, um, with those dogs from the movie eight below that Disney actually Disney was phenomenal. The company I worked with Disney, they brought a big tractor trailer. <laughs> I was like, can I be a dog? They treated them like gold. The, uh, the actor dogs were eight below. So we were, and they were all pets that weren't wanted. I mean, you know, it gave them another shot and Disney was great about it and gave them a, a, a phenomenal shot. And then they had homes after that and everything, which was good. But yeah, I, I do love doing whatever type of rescue work that I can with dogs and, you know, especially, you know, my breed specific, which is Siberian Huskies, but I would do it with any dog. I mean, I almost brought home a German Shepherd one time. <laughs> I, I feel bad. I mean, you'll see a million, if, if anyone looks at Facebook, you'll see my, my dogs. I, I'll try to take a selfie. One of them will run up and it's like, hey, I want to be in this. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So you'll see my dogs randomly on Facebook all the time. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, heck, it, it makes you feel good you know, knowing that when you knowing that you saved a rescue dog and I mean concern that those are dogs like that need a home more than more than ever yeah that's I, I Los Angeles speaking of Los Angeles very hard area for rescuing because and everyone's like they kill the dogs instantly and it's like yes and no but you've got to remember look at the population of Los Angeles and then they only have so much room and I, I I've watched firsthand the rescues people across the country, great people. They don't get paid for this. And they're trying to get dogs out of these shelters. And it's tough. It's tough to get a dog from like Los Angeles to New York. And it breaks my heart. I, I have a hard time. It's on Facebook. I'll go through. I'm like, oh, hey, someone's talking about, you know, whatever movie. Great. And then we'll look at something. And then it's like, this dog's going to be, you know, put to sleep. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't read this anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm almost in tears looking at this going, I can't watch this. I'm like, you know, I can only have so especially Siberians, I have two, that's a handful. It's like having real children. I mean, they're, you know, they want to break out. They want to hunt. They're like apex predators. I mean, it's, they look pretty, but you can't ever take them off leash. And then they don't like to be confined. You know, it's, like, it's like a gremlin. You can't do this, this, and this with a Siberian. But, you know, I want to help as much as I can. And hopefully as an actor, as more things open up for me, hopefully when I'm doing stepping stones, you know, it'll allow me to do more, more that I can actually make a difference. Oh yeah, and I mean, certainly so. And I mean, just by even like uh, supporting all these charities, like for all these homeless pets. And I mean, heck, like even doing the smallest of acts, like can change the entire world for just that one homeless pet. Oh, I agree. When we had our facility, as we had a dog daycare and boarding, I'm like, okay, how many dogs? How many? We have three open kennels. We can take some in right now until we can get them in foster. You know, let's, and I, I would do it all the time. If I don't have paying clients, we would have them inside the kennels. And it's like, they can stay here and they got to play all day. My facility, they played all day. By the time you got them in bed, people are like, you put them in a cage or we have to put them, I can't let them wander all night. But by the time we got them in there, 20 minutes later, all the paid guests and non-paid guests, they're out. <laughs> if you took a picture, they were, they ate, they were, I was like, holy cow, you don't hear any dogs barking. They were playing all day. So it was cool when I had that facility, a lot of work, let me tell you, but when I had that when I was younger, you made a difference in these dogs' lives. It's like, you know, no matter where they came from, they got to come even with us before they got put in foster and play all day and then sleep and then have interaction be a dog. You know, they got to run around, they got to play, they got to have fun. Um, and that's the thing I like, you know, it's like, I, I get sad when I see stories of any dog, 
you know, the dogs that are left in the shelters. It's like, I, I have a hard time. It's like, oh my gosh, it eats me alive looking at that. Um, I wish there was more I could do to help. I really do. Certainly, yeah. And, and that's why that I always am in tears whenever I see those commercials on TV, especially whenever they play in, in the arms of an angel like that. They'll play that song is because that it, it's one of those songs like where it instantly makes you want to cry and then seeing all these homeless pets and just knowing how depressed that they look. I mean, that would be a really horrible way for a dog to have to spend their life. And, and even worse for some of them, they don't find a home that they'll be put to sleep. And I'm like, that's just depressing. I, I couldn't agree more. I told, told my wife, if we're ever working on a movie and someone's like, we don't want the actor dog. I'm like, Honey, I don't care who they are. They're going home with us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. They're not being put in a shelter. And you said that never happens. But I said, you know, if someone goes, well, we don't want your co-star in the movie, I'm like, we're, we're taking them. <laughs> okay, whoever it is. I, it's a chihuahua. We're taking the chihuahua. You know, it's like I told her, be prepared. One day something's going to happen where they're like, you know, and I, I heard that with the um, Game of Thrones. You know, they were done with the dogs. And some of the actors adopted the dogs. And I thought that was great. You know, it's like. Especially if you have a bond with them, why not? If they like you and you have a bond, yeah, why yeah. not adopt them? If you, have, if you can do it and you're able to do it, why not adopt? I mean, I think it's so cool. And I told them, if that ever happens, if they're done with the dog, they're, they're coming home and I'll make it work. You know, it's like, we'll make it work. Yeah, yeah, a, exactly. And, and, and it's a very cathartic feeling knowing that you are giving this dog a second chance at life. I know. It's, and I, they, they don't know better. They can't. They can't say me. I mean, they do say things. My my dogs say a bunch of things, and I'm like, okay, you're telling me off. Thank you. It's like, <laughs> living with a, it's like having a, a a roommate from another country in your house. They kind of understand about 50 words, and you're like, okay, this is great. But that's 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 what I love about dogs. It's like it's literally like when you're in college and you had some roommate from another country. You're like, I'm not sure what you're saying here, but we'll go eat, okay? But that's how dogs are. It's like having guests from another country, but they love you, and that's the universal language with them. So it's like, I, I'm heartbroken every time I, I am. I, I, I hope again that my career is able to take off to the point where I'm able to make a huge difference. So. Yeah, well, hey, well, and I mean, hey, you know, as long as you work hard for it, as long as you're determined, and as long as you believe in yourself, anything truly is possible. I, I do believe that, and thank you. Yeah, 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 man, of course. And I just want you to know, that you know that not only do your friends and family support you, but I, I also want you to know that you also have mine. Thank you, you're Eric. You're awesome. I do appreciate it, and I, I do appreciate you know everyone that friends, family, um, people that follow me on Facebook and other social media. You know, I always try to do my best to reach back out to people that reach out to me. Um, you reach out to me. I'm, I'm I try my best to reach out to people. But we get bombarded sometimes, but you know, oh, I, yeah. I, I, I yeah, it's like oh my gosh, there's so much going on, but. I do my best to try to reach back out to everyone. And try I, I treat like it says on my Facebook profile, I treat people with kindness, and that's that's try, that's literally how I try to live life. I mean, I'm, am I perfect? No, no. no, nope, 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 nope. But I I try to do the right thing when I can. Yeah, which I mean, hey, I, I mean, ultimately that's what matters is because that you really truly never know what it is that somebody is having to. You, you really never know what somebody is dealing with in their life. And, and so that's why that it's always really important, like to treat them with the most kindness that you could, because that literally could save their entire life. I've had people, you know, just simple talking to someone in the store. They're like, they're on a really bad day. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, <laughs> you know, I'm glad you're talking to me. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I treat everyone like, you know, I don't care who it is. Just like when I'm on the movie set, I treat everyone. You know, it doesn't matter if they're the PA, you know, I'm like, hey, do you want me to help you with that? And they're like, what? I'm like, I don't, do you want me to move the box for? I'm a big guy. I can move the box. It's all right. They don't like that. But, you know, I'll move the box. I'll help you with things, especially on indie films. It's like, you know, I'm not going to make you haul everything around. I, I have no problems. If I can do it, I'll do it. You know, I, I treat everyone as kindly as possible. And I don't expect anything. That's a big thing. I never expect anything in return. I just, you know, I'm taking care of and not to get religious by a higher power. And that's, that's, you know, that's what I'm always thankful for. And I try to wake up every morning, just be thankful for small things, just really. And it's, you know, crazy to the people, but it's just very, very small things. You just wake up and you go, wow, you know, do we have debt? Yeah. Do we have this? Yeah. There's all kinds of problems, but there are people that don't even have a house. There are people that lost their house in the hurricane. 
there's people that are unemployed. There's people that can't even afford to put food on the table. There's people that have to give their pets away because they can't afford them. There's people that, you know, everyone's in a different situation. And I learned a long time ago in my ripe old age that, you know, you should be thankful for simple things because not everyone has even the simple things that we take for granted sometimes. Oh, yeah, certainly so. And, uh, yeah, and I mean, we often get caught up in the things we do, we do not have when we should be thankful for the things that we do have. And yeah, and as far as like being kind to people, there was one time where I heard a story about how there was these two guys in high school. One of them was, you know, not the popular kid. He was picked on and then he was actually wanting to commit suicide and ultimately one of the popular kids and then, you know, made friends with him. And then, you know, um, um, and then, and then honestly, like just by him being nice to that other guy literally saved his entire life. And so, yeah, I mean, you really truly never know what is it you're going through. Um, and then you said about how, uh, about how you don't expect anything in return. Now, honestly, that is how it should be done. Like you, you should do it. It's because you genuinely want to do it. Like you, you should do it. It's because it makes you feel good and you should do it. Not because you're expecting any sort of reward. I remember lending money to people even recently and I'm like, you know, you don't hear me ever ask for it back. You know, would it be great to have it back? Yes, but I don't not to lose our friendship over it. You know, I, you know, I've been blessed with a lot of things that I, you know, if you never pay me back, that's fine. You know, I trust you and rather have our friendship than that. And if you're in that bad of a situation, please don't pay me back. Make sure your family's taken care of. I said that to a friend of mine and I'm like, um, Make sure your family's taken care of. How are you doing? You know, I don't care. You don't hear him even asking about it. You know, and it needs some alive. And I'm like, please don't. You know, please don't. <laughs> Maybe I have debt. I'm, you know, it's like things aren't always great. But again, you look at the simple things in life and it's like, I, I don't need that money back. You know, could I use it? Sure. Could we all use money? Sure. But I don't need it. You know, I, I have food on the table. I have, you know, a home. And I'd rather have someone that is, you know, going through hard time, not worry about paying me back. Don't worry about that at all. You know, I'll be taken care of in, in, in some other ways that, you know, I, I have strong faith. In. So that's, that's why I'm like, don't, don't even think about it. Don't think twice about it. So, Certainly. Yeah. 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 And, and I mean, it just feels cathartic knowing that you are helping somebody out like who needs it. I, yeah, I, and I try not to make a big deal about it. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like, like I said, even the simplest things on, on the set. I've watched, on, on, you know, when we're making movies, I've seen people treat people really bad. And I'm like, you know, I'll tell some of them, don't worry about it. Listen, like, do you want me to get you something? <laughs> I said that to a PA one time. Do you want me to get you something? They're like, what? I'm like, what do you what do you want? I'll go get something for you. I, 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 I don't have to shoot for a couple hours. You know, I'm here. It's in between scenes. Oh, you, you want lunch? That's not this. I will get it for you. You know, it's just people, everyone deserves respect and kindness and love. And as soon as people realize that, the world becomes a better place. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I'm not perfect. I am not perfect at all. But, you know, and I don't really put that out there. And it just, you know, when you think about just simple things in life, and I try to make things very simple. It's like, you know, how would how would you want someone to treat you? You know, how much of a difference would it make in your world if someone acknowledged you or said hi or smiled once or even, you know, a simple gesture is just it makes all the difference in the world. Oh, yeah, certainly so. And so I guess my next question, um, unfortunately, there are times where like, we will get discouraged from pursuing our dreams and, you know, like with breaking into the industry, being an actor or yeah, like just being a part of the industry all in all. And so I guess my next question, what would be your advice to like to anybody who wants to pursue their dreams um, and uh, having to deal with people who, who will try to discourage them? There will. It'll, if it's an acting, if it's um, anything, you know, you, you've got to, how bad do you want it? I've had that discussion with people. How bad do you want it? What are you willing to do to get it? If you're going to have someone tell you no and then you give up, you don't want it bad enough. Yep. 
Are you going to listen to the people that tell you no? I remember in radio, I had a high-pitched voice. I don't now. I can't even say why I don't know, but um, I'm big, so you put two and two together there. Um, but they, oh, you're never going to be big in radio. Never. And I ran some of the biggest radio stations in the country. I was on the air. And I'm like, the heck with you. I'm doing this. You know, you can tell me no as much as you want. And it's, you have to have self-drive in anything. If you want to be an accountant and no one's hiring you, you've got to figure out how to do it. You know, and acting, it's like there's a million actors out there. There are. Let's not fool. There's five million people doing this or something like that in, in all of entertainment. I thought I read somewhere. You know, what makes you different? And you've got to take what makes you different and market it. Certainly. And not everyone's going to like it. You know, do, do you, I'm sure I tell people all the time, I'd love to be on the Hallmark Channel or I'd love to do a rom-com, but I'm literally the size of a rock. <laughs> and it's like doing a rom-com probably isn't going to be, you're not going to see Andrew doing a rom-com because, you know, that's not where my specialty fits. I'm an action guy. You know, you like to see, you know, it's like, Take what you have and really grab onto it and know what makes you different and believe in yourself and go forward. That's what you got to do. Don't give up when someone says no. Don't give up when someone says like, you know, gives your their brutal, honest opinion. Some people have no filters. They will tell you honestly what they think. And you're like, wow, okay. And a lot of times I'm like, you know, that's good. Because a lot of people like as an actor, they'll be like, oh, no, we're the best thing ever. Well, that, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> you know, I'm just a... You know, and that's that's great, but, you know, the people that can give you constructive criticism, you can take it, you can learn from it. Yep. And know that you can't change it for everyone, but know what makes you special and what makes you different and what makes you marketable. And that's what you need to do. And that's not just an acting, that's, you know, anything you do. And that's what's going to help you get what you want in life. Certainly, yeah. And, uh yeah, and dealing with that rejection is definitely going to have to be something that you know any actor will will have to deal with. And unfortunately, there are some actors who will take that personally, and that they'll think it's like that there's something wrong with them. But you know, but sometimes, like sometimes, yeah, like it is that person like just being rude to you. But often, uh, 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 other times, it's because you just weren't right for the part. And, and I mean, it's not because that you did a bad job, it's because you just weren't right for the part. And, you know, and uh, ultimately, every no is going to lead you to finally get your yes, but you're not going to get your yes if you surrender. Exactly. And at the end of the day, you have to remember, they're going to choose who they think best depicts the character. You know, again, Andrew in a Hallmark commercial or a Hallmark show or a movie, probably I'm not the best person to fit the whole, I love you, it's snowing here. You know, it's, I'm probably not that the best fit for that. So do I take it personally? No, because I know that's not my strength. Um, and even if it was my strength that I fit the character, they may see something else that they want from somebody else that fine tunes me. You're, you're playing the character. You are, you, are, you are taking that character off paper and bringing it to life. Yep. You are the character for that movie. So they want it convincible. You know, they don't just want to hire you as we like you. Man, I've had every, you know, a lot of people like me that you know, fit in every role. So it's like, at the end of the day, you will take no, but think of how many no's it takes to get to a yes. So if it takes five no's to get that one yes, you know, you have to one, two, three, four, five. Oh, next one is going to be a yes. Average it out. That's what I used to do when I did sales. It's like, how many no's did I get before I got a yes? How much yep. is it worth if you made ten thousand dollars on ten no's and that that other one was a yes? That's a thousand dollars for every no that you got. So okay, thank you. I'm thinking that's a thousand dollars I just need. I know at number ten I'm going to get a yes. And if you look at it that way, it's just part of that process of getting the yes. It's flipping your mind to that, and it's tough. It is tough. It it's is. A, it's a mind game. It really is. All of it is. You know, and you start doubting yourself as an actor. You're like, oh, man, I suck. I've got no, you don't think I've been told no? Of course I have. It's like, you know, I get a lot of people that are like, man, we want someone your size. We want this. We want that. But I've gotten told no. And I'm like, oh, man, I, you know, I thought it was perfect for the role. But obviously not. There's something that they want from someone else that maybe I didn't bring to the table. And if you know that going in, it makes it a little easier. Is it ever easy? No. Come on. It's hard getting, it's hard. You have to have thick skin. 
Oh, um, yes, you do. <laughs> Hazel uh, says, you've got to have thick skin. And it's like, when you do that, it's like sales. When I did sales, it's like, no, we're not interested. No, no. Don't, did you hear me, Andrew? No, I don't want this. And it's like, okay, next. And it's like, you know, that's fine. But, you know, you develop thick skin as a salesperson. As an actor, you're pretty much a salesperson. You're selling the character. Develop the thick skin. And more no's aren't bad, especially if you have a hard time hearing no. Let's do it more. I'll Let's hire five friends of mine to come in and tell you no, just so you get used to it. And eventually you're like, okay, no problem. And then you fine tune it. Maybe it's, and at least ask, you know, what, you know, I'm just curious. I, I thought I did good with the audition. What didn't go well with this? Or was there something I didn't bring? Can I cut a, can I try a different approach with it? Or, you know, and you may not have that opportunity. Casting director is not a good thing. Everyone, but if you do ask them, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. especially in the smaller movies, ask them, you know, what is it that uh, could I improve on or what didn't I bring? Just find out if there's some constructive feedback. You know, and then, you know, maybe it's something if you hear it over and over enough, maybe it's like, okay, maybe I need to go learn to improv better. Maybe my voice needs to come up higher. Maybe there's something different that you can go take care of. But, I mean, it's tough. No's are not a good thing, but they're great things as well because the more no's you can handle, the more fun the yeses become. Certainly, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and I mean, it really reminds me of a saying that I once heard is that failure is going to be your greatest teacher in life, but it doesn't mean you yourself are a failure. It means either the circumstances didn't go in your favor, or it means you made some sort of mistake, but you can't change the past, but what you can do is learn. Absolutely. I remember Phil Herman, one of the uh, directors for, and producers and creators of Jacker series, he wrote something about, I've been very, been very lucky. And I wrote the other day on Facebook, I said, listen, when I worked for Disney, luck is a combination of opportunity and ability. I don't believe in luck. You have opportunity, you have ability, and those two come together. You can, you can help forge your destiny, you know? There's sure. just, you know, how, how, how good is the opportunity? Do you have the ability to make it happen? You know, that's, that's, that's what it is. There's no luck. It's like, you can do it. Take control of it and go forward. That's what I did. I don't, I'm telling you, when you have a B plan, the B plan becomes the A plan. I don't care who you are. Oh, yeah. you. It's like, if this doesn't work, well, you're already saying if this doesn't work, you're already not letting it work. Don't have a B plan, have an A plan and stick with the A plan, you know? Certainly. Yeah. And you know, I, you know, when he said that about opportunities, it reminds me of a quote well, I, like from Jim Carrey and yeah. And Jim once said that life opens up opportunities for you and you can either take you can either take them or you can stay afraid of taking them. And honestly, that's one of the best life quotes that I have ever heard. It's true. I mean, what are you going to do? It's like, are you, what are you afraid of? Literally, what, what is there to be afraid of? You know, maybe you should try it. You know, it's like, remember that movie, The Yes Man? Yes. Like, yes, I'll do that. Yes. 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 I mean, yes. 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 Board, yes. But I mean, yeah, yes. Yes. Do I want mail order run? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. I'm like, yeah, it's okay, I'll go to your parties. But I mean, I mean, it's over-exaggerated, but same thing. It's like, you know, don't be afraid to say yes to something. Yeah, people overthink stuff too many times, you know? Yep. And nowadays in Hollywood, it's like, you know, someone's like, oh, Andrew, you don't want to do that movie or whatever. And I'm like, why? Oh, it's, you know, this, this, or this. And I'm like, okay, I don't see it that way. And if it's bad, there's another one that's going to be out that I'll be good in. It's the days of we have two movies out a year by major studios and if you stink at them you'll never get another job or gone you got all the a-list people doing netflix um all these other streaming movies and series and stuff hollywood's flipped upside down so take the chance you know and you never know i i've done stuff where i'm like well <laughs> i'm gonna do it i'm not sure and then all of a sudden it's like man i am so glad i signed up for this i'm so glad i did this because it's changed everything and that's the best situations ever is when it has the opportunity to flip your life upside down. You never know. I mean, when you look back and you go, when you're playing in a scene with maybe someone you looked up to in horror, and you're like, wow, did I really just play in a movie, you know, where Lisa Wilcox played my wife? Did that, did that just happen? <laughs> it's like, what? You know, if you asked me this a year ago, I'd be like, I don't know, you're crazy. That would never happen. And then all of a sudden, things happen. They happen for a reason. This yeah. Is, it's just, they do, and it comes together. And if it's supposed to happen, it's even going to be stronger. That's, that's just what I believe, so. 
Yeah. And I mean, so, so many of us are too afraid to, you know, I like to take those chances in life because we're just so scared that what if it doesn't work out? But the other side of that coin is that what if it does? Well, if it didn't work out, you're still in the same spot, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if it did, oh my gosh, then you're like, man, I'm glad I said yes to it. I'm glad I tried it. But I mean, the, the, at the end of the day, if you're going to say yes to it, go in with everything. The difference is like when I do even smaller micro budget movies, I tell the director, I'm like, listen, I'm going in hundred percent on this. I, I'm not here to mess around. I'm not, I, I take it very seriously being an actor. I want to look good on camera. I want everyone else to look good. I want the scene to look good. I want this to be the best thing we've ever done. And I, and I want every scene and every take to be like that. I take it very seriously. So when you're doing it, Jump in feet first, but take it serious. Don't go, well, I might try this. No, commit to it. Do it. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, either that you give it your all, and if you're not going to give it your all, well, then what's the point? There's no point of doing it. I, I, I hate to be like that. There's no point of doing it. If you're not going to try, you're not going to commit, you're not going to give it your all, you're not doing yourself any favors, you're not doing, like in a movie, the director, you're not doing the fans any favors that are going to watch your movie. You know, I hear this all the time. Well, they didn't, you know, I didn't try or this was bad. I'm like, well, why was it bad? You know, were you not trying in the movie? You know, I, I was reading interviews with some actors. Right? No, I didn't. And I always wonder what was going through your head, you know? And it's like, I know things, things can be different behind camera when on sets and whatnot. But, you know, if you're not trying, you're not giving your 100%, why are you there? Certainly, yeah. I, I mean, otherwise, you're just wasting your time and you're wasting their time, too. And that's, and it's like, if you, and I hear people complain, I'm not getting paid enough. I'm not doing that. Then don't do it. If that's, if you're coming in with that attitude, go home. We, no one wants to hear it because if you're with me, I want your A game here. I want you to outshine me in a scene because the scene becomes strong. I want you to bring it. When you're, when you're on a scene with me, bring it. Come on, don't hold back. Bring it, you know, bring it, bring your A game there. You know, I want this to look good. I want people to watch the movie and go, man. This is great. And I've had scenes where I'm like, you know, at the end of the, when halfway through a movie when I was shooting one of my movies, it was like, man, you and you, this other person had great screen chemistry. I had no idea, but it made sense because they brought it, you know, and then you have chemistry in a movie and it's like, wow, holy cow, where did this come from? Because both people are bringing their A game. Whatever you do, bring your A game. Be prepared. Not, well, I'm not, no, 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 no. There's no excuses. You bring your A game, you put it on, you commit, you do it. It, it, exactly, yeah, one hundred percent. Like, that's definitely one of the best ways t to put it. <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, but yeah, so I think that about does her. Uh, but yeah, um, but yeah, so basically, um, if people want to check out all of your previous works, uh, where exactly could they check those, check those out at? Um, I would say check out IMDb, the Internet Movie Database, which has like the authority for Hollywood. It's, it's like our history has everything on there. It'll have um, movies that are coming out, which is really good. Movies that I'm working on, movies that um, might not even be close to filming yet, but it, not just for me, but for anyone, that is a great place. If you ever want to know about your favorite films, go to the IMDb and you'll be able to learn everything you can about any movie out there from anyone that was on the crew, the cast, the director, the actors, and you'll be able to follow people you like as well. So I always tell people, IMDb, best place ever. And a lot of my films will be, some will be in the theater, some will be on Amazon, Tubi, I just mentioned, some will be on Tubi, probably a lot of them on Tubi as well, just because they cross over, but um, it's going to be distribution. And I, on my Facebook page, if you follow me, I usually post all the trailers um, where you can find certain movies that I have coming out and things like that. So I'm pretty good at keeping up with Facebook. Awesome. Uh Awesome. Uh, but yeah, uh, I definitely will be sure to share all the trailers and, you know, and just to show my support and I'll be sure to go watch them in theaters, watch them on Tubi, you know, just watch them anywhere. And, and, and yeah, for all my followers, uh, yeah, definitely be sure to check out Andrew's content and, uh, and yeah, follow him on all, all forms of social media. And, uh, and yeah, so before that we go, uh, besides all, all the projects that you said, do you have anything else uh, coming up like that you would want the audience to be aware of? Let's, you know, I'm filming Alien Horde, but I mean, we're probably two years from seeing that. It's 
CGI based. I've got um, yeah, yeah. let's see now, Jacker three. If you're watching this interview right now or very soon, Jacker three will be coming out. I'm not sure what the distribution is. I, I'm the actor. I don't handle the distribution for the movie, even though I'm, I think I'm one of the executive producers on it. My production company is filming a part of it, but I'm not doing the distribution. So um, as soon as that comes out, Amazon. A lot of the independent films, Amazon's a great place to check them yep. out. Um, I know with the Mahals, with like um, Arena Wars just came out, Paramount Plus. It's, uh, I'm, when I'm on Paramount Plus, you're going to be seeing me going, you know, that's a big thing as an indie actor and whatnot, being Paramount Plus, MGM Plus as well, for some of the bigger budget movies. Tubi, if you ever want to watch really cool horror movies, Tubi is where you can, you'll, you'll see some of mine and a lot of other ones if you're just, and it doesn't cost anything, it's ad based. Uh -huh, so. Yeah. You know, I love Tubi for that, and you'll, you'll be able to see a lot of work. So, yeah, between Amazon, Tubi, some will show up on Netflix eventually, I'm sure. And a couple of mine um, should be in the theaters. Like, one of them probably would devour, which I play. Not a not a huge part, but a pretty good scene. Um, that should be in theaters next year on a limited release nationwide. Awesome. Uh, but, yeah, I definitely will be sure to check that out. And I guess my final question uh uh, what's some of the best life advice that you could give to all my viewers? Don't give up. You know, I, I, it's like if you want to do it, go do it. Yeah. You've got one life. You've got one chance. Only one. And it's like, you, you know, you, you can sit there and wish and pray that your life is different or you can go out and change it. And I know people are like, well, I've tried. No, you can change it. Believe me, I've hit bottom. We've all hit bottom. Yeah. You know? Part of life. But you can go out and change it. And people are always there somewhere there to help you, you know, and that's, that's the hardest thing is just going, you know, I'm going to take control and I want it, you know, I'll gamble everything I got if I have a dream and that when you're at that level, you'll be successful. You know? and it's, 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 it's tough and it's uncomfortable. You have to get uncomfortable in life to move ahead. And that's, yeah. that's what I'm gonna say. You gotta get. Believe me, as an actor, you throw it all out there. You're, you're I'm putting myself out there in a movie that is, you know, you can watch if it's good or bad. You're gonna watch it over. You know, you can see it whenever you want. And there's Andrew either performing well or, in some people's opinions, not. But you're putting yourself out there. So put yourself out there if you really want it. Go get it. it Certainly. Can yeah. yeah, you know because the, the last thing you want to do is to reflect on it years later and then go, man, I really wish I would have taking that chance and then have that missed opportunity. And uh, yeah, and I mean, ultimately just got to make the the most out of that one chance at life that you have because eventually all of your seconds are gonna run out. It goes by like this. And pretty soon you wake up and go, I should have done that. You don't yep. want to be the should have person. You want to go, and, and let's just say you fail at it. At least you tried it. The last thing you want is regrets in life. Go through and do it. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go to my deathbed eventually and regret, man, I should have done this. Or I wanted to do this, I never did it. I try to do everything that I've ever wanted to in life and live it. Because, again, you've got one shot. Be kind to people, live it, and, you know, go do it. If you want it, take the bull by the horns and, and grab it. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. And to finish it off, it's like a quote from Rocky Balboa. It's not about how hard you get hit, but how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Yes, it is. Definitely. Well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate everything. I, think I appreciate you having me on your show today. Oh, yeah. Certainly. Uh, but, yeah, certainly. I will let you know when this is up. And, and yeah, and uh, I'll be sure to share. I'll be sure to tag you. And, and, yeah, you and I definitely will keep in touch. That sounds good. Thank you again. Yeah, yeah, of course. You have a fantastic day.